was thinking that might be a good thing to start in, in seeing how uh, as a topic point because as um, as we look back when ether the, the notion of the ether was coming out as we were talking religion is somewhat on a decline um, we're looking at evolution we're seeing all these kind of incongruent things in nature it's like what, this maybe it's like this the seams on religion are starting to come unraveled and spiritualism comes in as a way to kind of inject a notion like religion, maybe religion light, into science and somehow get that picked up by the mill of science and somehow f pull it back into plot. And almost as a way of, all right, well, you've disproved this. Maybe we can use your methods to somehow prove that there is something. Maybe religion as we've known it for thousands of years is still religion, but it's just a different view. So I was just thinking that might be a thing that we could kick off our talks. One of the things that happened with phrenology, or there are two things which became relevant for this. One was if you, if you looked at the, the figure, I think it's still up, the, the region on the top of your head was where the, the, the part of your brain that ha handled religiosity. So you, you, could, you could feel someone's skull and get a sense of what this was going to be like for them. So <laughs> phrenology tried to incorporate religion in that respect. But the theories raised a lot of anxieties as well, because if all the brain functions, all the functions of the mind were contained in the brain, well then the question was where was the soul? Mm -hmm. And how are you gonna handle this thing? And is everything totally material? Uh, is there any free will? Or is right. everything that happens totally driven by the functions of these brain areas? Where, where did you say the religious? My, I'm so intensively religious, so I'm, it's causing hair loss. <laughs> Oh, it's true. When, when they, the people in the, at the end of the 19th century began to relate the heater with the spiritualism, was exactly this the, the, the movement that they make. So, since we can explain a physical phenomena with an unphysical entity that is everything, so it uh, possible to study physically the uh, not physical phenomena. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a, a kind of a, um, a translation of a physical reasoning in a non-physical context. And this was um, very strong at the end of the 19th century. A lot of people wrote, uh, uh, um, theor theorists of, uh, or experimentalists, about electromagnetism about the unseen world, the unseen world that linked physics with religion. This is uh, very, very explicit in the writings of the period. So that, that's sort of a Tesla was, was sort right. of working on that kind of thing, looking at the physicality of spiritu physics, physical nature of spirituality. Yeah, okay, yeah, Tesla was very particular. He was an engineer, a Serbian American engineer, he's very famous. Uh, he made something very interesting, he also <laughs> had some patents uh, with a lot of money and after he lost everything. Uh, however, he tried to do this, uh, <laughs> it was not very spiritualist, he tried to interact with the ether, he tried to create matter, because the matter was only a kind of particular motion of the ether, but it's not, not very spiritualist. <laughs> It was a, a way to find something that the, to Prometheus. <laughs> it was a, the the, war, the the man was like God. It was able to create matter if he was able to interact with the ether. So this uh, I think that it was not very religious, but it was very very material. Only that he thought that the material was in the heater and not in the matter. Oh, the matter was a part of the heater. It was only a motion, a vertical motion of the heater. So if we think about the what-if scenario, if, if we are looking at spirituality as more a driving force, how does that shape evolution, for instance, now? Are we, do we now start teaching intelligent design honestly? <laughs> Is that how that works? Fingers crossed, as a Kentuckian. <laughs> <laughs> I should explain, I'm actually here under slightly bogus circumstances. I'm not a historian of science. I have an interest in the history of science. I'm an evolutionary biologist. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Um, but yes, I have to say, and I, it embarrasses, I'm also an um, 
Alfred Russell Wallace fanatic. I mean, I feel the same way about Wallace as Darwin did about Beatles. Um, uh, and I, I'm slightly sorry to say that the, um, the latest uh, Wallace biography, and I should say Wallace was sorely neglected for years and years and years because I don't know quite what it is with the bearded sage of Down House. Some, he just sort of created his own press almost and people were endlessly writing and revising biographies of bloody Darwin. Um, but it wasn't until about 10 years ago when finally somebody noticed that we knew everything there was to know about Darwin, right? I mean, every, we knew what he had for breakfast every day. And because, actually, um, he had this, this endless um, health complaints, and because he was an absolute obsessive note-taker, we even know every bowel movement for a long period of time. <laughs> In fact, a friend of mine wants to write a book about his, um, his dietary problems entitled The Origin of Feces. Um, um, about, about ten years ago, the Darwin industry had plateaued. We knew everything. There was nothing new to add. Um, um, so people started writing books about Wallace, which was rather nice, and there have been uh, five or six fairly major treatments of Wallace's life since then. Um, the latest one is actually published, I think, actually under the auspices of um, the Discovery Institute, which is a Seattle-based uh, think tank which champions intelligent design. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm not a fan. Um, they are the ones who are organizing state-by-state -state attempts to get intelligent design or various creationist um, paradigms uh, into your American uh, schoolrooms. But I do think it's rather telling that Wallace, Wallace's mix of science, because you can't be a straight-out creationist these days because of the First Amendment. It's a bit, you know, <laughs> it creates problems. Um, you really can't teach um, Noah's Ark in a science classroom, okay? Um, There's a separation of church and state. But if you, can, if you can teach something that looks like science, smells like science, sounds like science, but actually isn't, and this is what intelligent design is all about, um, then you're in good shape. And this is, this is very much the strategy of the Discovery Institute. And they have, and it's rather Johnny come lately, but they have adopted Wallace as their latest icon, I'm sorry to say. Would, would Wallace have adopted them? Would Wallace have adopted them? That's a really good question. Uh, I, it depends which Wallace we're talking about. Wallace lasted a very long time. He died in his 90th year in 1913. Um, we're coming next year is what the centenary of Wallace's death. Um, if, as a young man, he certainly would have disavowed them, and as time went on, I think he would have become more and more attracted um, to at least that component of their thinking. One, com there is the the Discovery Institute is it's much more than just oh intelligent design is a nice idea. It's actually got a full on political agenda. Uh, it's a very reactionary organization, and that. Wallace, and this is the joy of Wallace, Wallace, unlike Darwin, Darwin was this rather boring guy. Yes, he published The Origin of Species. He spent the next 20 years concretizing that, publishing ever more detailed, supportive stuff. I mean, that's why the theory was, has been so successful from the get-go, because Darwin was so extremely thorough in documenting it. Wallace got back from Indonesia. He's co-published with Darwin now. He's, he's made it. He's, he's reached the upper echelons of British science. And he uses his fame as a springboard to write passionately and enthusiastically about everything, including the nationalization of the railways, including the true identity of Shakespeare. In, in, I mean, really, literally, literally everything. Many of his writings um, were on economics. And he was literally, I mean, he was a very early socialist. He was, for many years, the president of the Land Nationalization Society, um, which argued, um, interestingly, that the root of all social evil was the private ownership of land and that the government should own all land and we should lease it from the government. And that would solve, and I think he's probably right. Anyway, <laughs> anyway the long answer to your question, yes, he might have been comfortable, certainly by the latter stages of his life, with the scientific claims of the Discovery Institute, but once he found out what those people were really about, he would have been um, quite belligerently again.
Uh, so then tying in phrenology, how is, uh, how would a uh, Wallacean uh, phrenologist operate? Wallace wrote an essay uh, in uh, a book in t about the new century. This was written in the last years of, well, in 1899, looking into the 1900s. And, you know, this is all sort of millennial. It's all very exciting with the technology driven. Uh, and it, <laughs> it's not, not his greatest moment. It's beautifully written, but he does write, he writes an essay on phrenology uh, extolling its virtues. He, he uh, actually concludes that, that in time it will come to be real, realized to be, quote, the true science of mind. You know, one question would be, would the phrenologists then have welcomed modern neuroscience as the descendant of, what, of the project they had embarked on? I, I think if you were a phrenologist confronted with these questions of spiritualism that came up later in the century, I, people are, were, would likely have gone in two directions. One would just say, oh, th no, this is nonsense. We're interested in these material, concrete things. It was, phrenology was very much grounded in the, the, the matter, the material stuff of the brain. But it would also have been very easy. It's a, it's a flexible theory. You could have accommodated it, and you would have had a, a revision of the phrenology map. It would have had a section of the brain that you would have mapped by studying the prominent phrenologists who obviously had the facility to commune with the, or you, you would have studied the spir spiritualists figured out what part of it their brain was enlarged that allowed them to commune with the spirit world, and you would have identified the spiritual region of the brain that gave you the, the, the ability to be attuned to the spirits, and then they would have revised the maps, and then if you were at the admissions committee at Harvard and you were interested in increasing the number of your spirituality majors, you would just adjust the admissions criteria appropriately and to get the people in who had the right talents to do what needed to be done. Cool. And then so uh, if ether were also incorporated into all of this and that spirituality uh, tied into looking at brain mat. So instead of uh, actual physical uh, brain uh, neurons firing, it's ether that sort of was involved in the process. How, how, do you, how would you see that coinciding? Trying to figure out what is the, the nature of the activity of the brain is something that continues to uh, puzzle people. Because on, on one hand, there are some people that say, well, you know, Whatever the brain does, it's just an electric chem electrical chemical organ. It, that's what it has to be. We know there's electrical activity. We know there's chemical activity. So that's what it is. It's electrical chemical activity. But try as they might to explain the higher cognitive functions now, you know, 200 years post phrenology, there's still a lot that isn't understood. And so again, it, it, maybe what neuroscientists are missing is the way that the ether permeates the brain. <laughs> and they're, and they're not, really, not the chemical ether. The the chemical that's just what undergrads do for fun. <laughs> uh. yeah, the important distinction, you know, the, the, the chemical ether uh, suppresses brain activity, so it puts you to sleep quite nicely. <laughs> the, no, and so, so maybe there is this missing element. You know, why has consciousness eluded decades of research by modern neuroscience? Uh, maybe they're looking at the wrong things. Maybe it's not just the electrical, electrical and chemical activity. Maybe it's the ether. Well, maybe, maybe we can try to um, uh, use our brain to communicate, not to maybe we spiritualism uh, imply the soul. So if we thought about only telepathy, if the brain is an electrochemical phenomena, it's possible to create some vibration with our chemical, electrochemical uh, activity with the brain, a uh, vibration that could communicate our thought with another people, only with the vibration of the ether that, uh, or some that the ether that interacts with the other person. So we can continue to speak, so without word. And, and sometimes this will come up. The one time I ever called into a radio show, uh, back, back <laughs> Did you win? <laughs> <laughs> no. 